<laughs> well, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> but, well, hello, everyone. Hope you were enjoying the music. Um, I definitely was. I saw some calls for roller skates uh, in, the, uh, in, in the chat. So, <laughs> um, so welcome to our um, October jam session for the Center for Health Equity. Um, I think we are, I think we're already recording. So awesome. So I'm, I'm Deidre Cruz. I think I've met many of you. Um, I'm a professor in the, in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology and also Deputy Director of our Center for Health Equity um, and excited to, um, to welcome you to our jam session for this month. Um, here along with Dr. Cooper um, is here as well, but we uh, certainly want to welcome you. And we are super delighted up to uh, have our speaker today, Dr. Lena Matthews, join us um, and, and share some of her work. Um, some of you may have already read a bit about her background in the, I think it was in our, in our calendar invite, but I'll read you some highlights uh, from that. And then we're going to do our, our fun but non-traditional way of, of introducing her in a moment as well. So so Dr. Matthews uh, was, was originally born in Kenya and moved to the U.S. Uh, when she was 13. Uh, she originally was, uh, they, the family moved to Queens, New York, and she um, went on to do undergrad at Cornell and medical school at University of Pennsylvania and did her internal medicine training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and then after residency, she uh, sought some opportunities to actually work um, back in Africa. Uh, she um, did some work in Rwanda, at, at, at providing medical care and support for um, some of the developing non-communicable disease programs that were there, including for people with hypertension, diabetes, rheumatic heart disease, and cancer. And then she then returned uh, to the U.S., to Baltimore. We were fortunate um, for her to come to, to Hopkins for cardiology fellowship, where she trained in both um, general cardiology as well as imaging. And she subsequently uh, received her training in epidemiology and biostatistics at our School of Public Health at Hopkins. Um, and uh, uh, Lena joined the faculty in, in uh, 2018, and I get to hang out with her clinically a lot as well. Our offices are actually on the same floor and <laughs> at Johns Hopkins Bayview, but know her for her, for her uh, inpatient work in particular, as well as she does work uh, reading echocardiograms. Um, so her work also extends to directing the cardiac rehabilitation program at Hopkins, which I'm, I'm uh, certain we're gonna hear some about today. And, and this is an area of interest of hers, uh, that of, of addressing health disparities when it, as, it, as it relates to utilization of some of the guideline concordant therapies regarding cardiovascular disease. And so, um, so that's the formal introduction. Um, we're going to have, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of, of some very interesting things about our speaker today. So one is that um, I think a lot of people know that Lena is a, is a runner. Uh, turns out she's also an avid hiker as well and um, has, has done a number of different kind of uh, backpacking tours, including um, uh, back in 2009, she um, backpacked across Spain by herself. Um, staying in hostels and visiting various towns um, and eating great food, uh, she shared with us. Um, and I, I want to see in the chat uh, if you all can, in, in thinking about these outdoor experiences that our speaker has had, um, wondering if you could guess um, the highest mountain that Lena has hiked. What is the, what is the height in feet of the highest mountain that Lena has hiked? Keeping in mind that she's from Kenya, so <laughs> so so I'll, we'll take we'll take uh, guesses in the chat. No, you don't have to name the mountain. Just give me feet. <laughs> give me. Okay, I see one for a thousand, one for twenty thousand. Okay, keep going. Fourteen thousand, ten thousand from Dr. Cooper. Any more? Thank you, Dr. Koresh, for the very specific. <laughs> It's like it's like the price is right for you. <laughs> so what how does it work with the price is right? It's like the closest you get without going over, right? Maybe we'll go with that. Okay. Um, so 
if we use the, the price is right rule, then Eri Erica wins, Erica Protaska wins at 13,000 because the highest mountain was Mount Muhabura, I think I pronounced that right, um, which is a 13,500 foot dormant volcano on the Rwanda-Uganda border. So uh, Linda, did you wanna add any context to that? Um, yeah, it was a very challenging hike. It was not a manicured trail. It took us maybe five hours to get to the top. And by the time we got to the top, we were cold and hungry and then an additional like eight hours to get to the bottom. So it's quite challenging, but <laughs> in the end it was worth it. Awesome. Well, you are, you are our hero for sure on that one. <laughs> so, so the next fun fact that you all get to participate in is, um, so Lena grew up in a town in the Rift Valley region of Kenya called Nakuru. Um, and it is famous for a wildlife reserve um, and a lake. And it has the world's largest sanctuary of what type of bird? We'll take guesses. And please don't use Google, but we'll take guesses in the chat. Pigeons. Okay, flamingos. Toucans. Sounds lovely. Other guesses? Uh, Lisa is convinced it's flamingos with an exclamation point. <laughs> Pigeons were for humor. Thank you, Thomas. We appreciate the humor. <laughs> Okay, the answer is indeed pink flamingos. <laughs> so, so Linda, did you want to share? Is this, is this a place you would visit often, or? Um, I only visited once, okay. uh, but uh, growing up in the town, um, it is uh, the lake uh, is the largest sanctuary of pink flamingos, and um, from the road you can just see the entire lake is covered with flamingos and looks pink. Um, so it's really an amazing sight every time we go by it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we visit one day. That's terrific. Well, well, this um, this ends our fun facts. Thank you all for playing. Um, <laughs> we're going to turn it over to Dr. Matthews. We can uh, hopefully we can get your slides okay. back up. We have one person in the audience whose mother is from the same Yeah, town. yeah. So Michelle yeah. Ogunwole oh, is here. Yeah. Her mom is from the Kuru. That's amazing to hear. Yeah. I'll share my slides now. Great, we're good. You're good. You see the screen. Okay, great. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all today. I've been uh, attending the jam sessions for the last few years and really been inspired by uh, everyone who's presented and uh, has really influenced how I have um, uh, looked at research and focused my research on the next steps in my career. So um, looking uh, at the end, hopefully looking for your uh, advice and uh, feedback on next steps. And hopefully some of you can also get inspired by some of the research I'm doing. And, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Cruz, for this opportunity to present uh, some of my research and um, research in progress. And uh, just this is an outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll just briefly uh, talk to you about my background. Uh, we spoke a little bit about it, but uh, I'll talk about my background and then um, epidemiology of cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, and then uh, the implementation of secondary cardiovascular disease prevention strategies and what's known thus far. And then we'll go into cardiac rehabilitation, what it is, the outcomes after cardiac rehabilitation and um, the implementation of cardiac rehabilitation in um, regular clinical care, and then strategies to increase cardiac rehabilitation participation. So uh, as Dr. Cruz mentioned, uh, this is uh, my background. So uh, actually my dad is originally from this part of India and in South India. I don't know if you can see my arrow. Um, 
but uh, moved to Kenya in the 1960s to uh, teach um, and was a high school teacher where he met my mom and they started a family. And I grew up in this town called Nakuru that, uh, as we said, has a huge uh, flamingo population. And this is just one of the pictures that I found online. Um, uh, around uh, 1994, um, when uh, I was about 13 years old, there was uh, instability going on in Kenya, political instability and a lot of ethnic and tribal clashes. And so we had to leave uh, Kenya and um, ended up moving to the US because there were some relatives in New York. So we moved to Queens. And this is a picture of uh, Queens uh, where we moved to. Um, uh, it's uh, Jamaica, Queens, and this is Jamaica Avenue and 88th Street. And you can see it's a very urbanized area. There's a um, really high density population. Um, and actually my first exposure to health disparities was actually in the US. Um, when we first moved here, you, you know, my parents couldn't find work uh, in the beginning and didn't, we didn't have health insurance. And um, you know, because of the high cost of care and lack of insurance, lack of preventive care, uh, my dad actually ended up, uh, you know, delaying seeking to seek care for, uh, you know, a, a lung infection and ended up, by the time he got to the hospital, was it was too late and unfortunately he passed. But this experience really opened my eyes on disparities that exist, um, especially uh, in um, not only urban areas, but rural areas. And, uh, um, was my inspiration to pursue medicine and focus on the healthcare of those who are medically underserved. So after doing my training in internal medicine in Boston, I then uh, really wanted to uh, go back to Africa uh, to you know, help, help uh, with the healthcare of people who are medically underserved. So I joined an NGO called Partners in Health uh, that's based in Boston, but does uh, clinical care and program building for infrastructure for healthcare in different parts of Africa and also Haiti and other parts of the world. Uh, I ended up going to Rwanda and I worked in this hospital called Butaro Hospital. And it's a hospital in um, the rural part, uh, a rural part of uh, Kenya, uh, sorry, of Rwanda, uh, nestled in the hills of Rwanda. And this is me here with some of the doctors uh, in uh, Butaro Hospital. And what we were doing was uh, caring for patients who had uh, cardiovascular disease. So uh, young patients with uh, rheumatic heart disease who are presenting in heart failure, uh, people with hypertension presenting with heart failure and strokes, and also patients with cancer. So um, this was a really eye-opening experience for me to see that um, there's a huge burden of uh, cardiovascular disease globally, not just in the U.S. And uh, I saw the immense potential uh, being a for being a cardiologist in uh, reducing uh, the devastating effects of uh, cardiovascular disease. Because what we know in cardiology especially is that we, over the last several years, there have been advances in medications and treatments. And I felt that if I learned more about cardiovascular disease, I may be able to go back one day and be able to actually make a difference. Um, I still continue to go back to uh, East Africa. So once a year, uh, before COVID at least, I go to um, uh, Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eastern uh, Kenya in a town called Eldoret, uh, where um, working with other colleagues at Duke, um, we partner with the local uh, physicians and university hospital to teach cardiology, imaging, and the care of patients with cardiovascular disease. So this is a picture on the right here is us doing ward rounds in the intensive care unit of the hospital. And the predominant uh, type of patients that we were managing were young patients in their 20s and 30s who had uh, effects, um, who are presenting with heart failure or other uh, medical complications from rheumatic heart disease. Um, so just uh, to uh, switch gears a little bit uh, from my background, I wanted to just show you this graph here. This um, 
is uh, from the AHA Heart and Stroke Statistics from 2022, showing the deaths attributable, attributable to cardiovascular disease between 1900 and 2019. And what we see here is that since the 1900s, um, there was a rapid rise in cardiovascular disease mortality in the US to a peak of about a million deaths per year. But then around 1960, something changed. Uh, what happened was that we learned about risk factors for cardiovascular disease, particularly smoking. Um, the Surgeon General issued a report about the adverse effects of smoking. We learned about hypertension and uh, um, diabetes and the effect on cardiovascular disease uh, through uh, large epidemiological studies like the Framingham Heart Study. And because of control of risk factors, what we saw is that uh, since the 1960s till about 2010, there was a gradual decline in cardiovascular disease mortality due to all these prevention efforts. And uh, this is primary prevention really, um, improve, uh, reducing risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But over the uh, same, same amount of time, there have been an uh, amazing amount of uh, advances in cardiovascular disease treatment and diagnosis. So for example, here is a picture of somebody uh, of a coronary bypass graft surgery and stents. So for people who come in with heart attacks, uh, in the old days, they would just uh, recuperate in a, in a dark room and hopefully they survive. But these days they can get bypass surgery. They can get stents within 20 or 30 minutes of presenting with a heart attack. In patients who have severe valve disease, they can get valve replacements surgically or even percutaneously through a small minimally invasive catheter um, in one of the arteries in the leg, and they go home the next day. Um, uh, defibrillators for people who are high risk uh, reduce the risk of dying suddenly of uh, heart arrhythmias. And of note, the first defibrillator uh, for, uh, for um, people with uh, a low ejection fraction was placed uh, at Johns Hopkins by uh, Dr. Levi Watkins. And we also have uh, a wealth of evidence-based guideline medications that have been uh, studied through rigorous clinical trials uh, for patients with uh, uh, stroke, heart failure, myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation. So in cardiovascular disease, we have an armamentarium of different um, treatments uh, for reducing the adverse effects of uh, recurrent, event recurrent events and mortality. And this is just a summary of what these secondary prevention strategies do. So for patients who have had a stroke or heart attack, aspirin and, uh, is recommended and it can reduce the risk of recurrent events uh, by about 30%. Um, statins reduce recurrent events in people who have myocardial infarction and stroke by between 14 and 29%. And for patients who have heart failure, particularly heart, particularly heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, there's clinical trials that are showing newer and newer drugs that can substantially reduce recurrent hospitalizations and mortality. And when it used in combination, they can even reduce mortality by 73%. Um, in atrial fibrillation, uh, if patients are put on anticoagulation, they reduce the stroke by 70%. Um, and then in patients with heart failure and at risk for arrhythmias, uh, defibrillators can reduce uh, risk of recurrent events by up to 50%. So this, uh, as I said, uh, just to reiterate, this uh, wealth of secondary prevention strategies that have been found in clinical trial to really reduce mortality uh, and recurrent events among patients with established cardiovascular disease. But what we see here is over the last 20, uh, 10 years, since about 2010, is uh, rising cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, and this can be explained by many things. I think of uh, maybe over the last two years, the effects of COVID-19 on people seeking preventive care, people accessing care, and the effects of COVID-19 on the heart. But really this uh, rise in cardiovascular disease mortality uh, predated uh, COVID-19. And we also know that underlying these, the rise in cardiovascular disease uh, mortality is significant disparities by both race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. Um, African-Americans and uh, individuals uh, who are minorities, uh, people with low socioeconomic uh, status 
are really disproportionately affected by ad adverse outcomes after cardiovascular disease. Uh, in this graph here by Glenn et al. published in 2019, they examined um, the age-adjusted heart failure-related re mortality in the U.S. between 1999 and 2017, and they stratified it by race and gender. And then uh, they first looked at younger adults and then older adults. And what we see here is that since 1999 uh, up to 2017, among uh, individuals with heart failure who are younger, the mortality rate among black men is the highest uh, among all four uh, of, of these four groups and continues to rise. Uh, black women uh, follow secondly uh, in terms of mortality um, for heart failure when they're younger. And uh, what we see is the similar finding in um, older adults, although less pronounced. And disparities uh, in uh, mortality by cardiovascular disease are here close to home uh, in Baltimore. In uh, one of my first epidemiology classes at the School of Public Health, um, someone showed this slide here and I was really struck by the disparities that exist in Baltimore uh, in life expectancy uh, between neighborhoods that were just a few miles apart. And that the area surrounding Hopkins, which is one of the oldest and most preeminent medical institutions in the country, had a significant lower life expectancy compared to areas in the North. And the number one cause of mortality uh, among older individuals is cardiovascular disease. Um, and this almost 20 year uh, difference in life expectancy uh, was for, further illustrated in uh, a book by Dr. Cooper uh, published recently, Why Are Health Disparities Everyone's Problems? Um, where she tells a story of two individuals who live uh, a few miles apart, Anita, an African-American woman who lives in the Latrobe neighborhood um, in, near Hopkins, who dies prematurely of a stroke at age 61. Uh, and Deborah, who's, um, a uh, white woman who lives in Roland Park, who uh, lives to a ripe old age of 90s and dies of old age. And uh, in this book, she explains how the types of health services that were available to them, the care, that, the care they receive and the manner in which they receive them was vastly different and really accounting for these disparities. And uh, these disparities are really unacceptable. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Seth Martin and the Digital Health Lab for providing this book for all um, colleagues in the Digital Health Lab, and it was uh, quite an insightful read. Um, so I showed you cardiovascular disease mortality in the U.S., but we know that globally cardiovascular disease mortality is also rising. In this paper published by uh, Roth et al. in 2020, they looked at mortality by, uh, among men and women uh, between 1990 and 2019. And the number of deaths over the last 30 years continues to rise steadily, up to 10 million people dying uh, each year of cardiovascular disease. And when they looked at the top five countries who um, have the highest number of cardiovascular disease deaths, Compared to 2010, uh, most countries had actually higher number of deaths in 2019. Um, and what would account for the rise in cardiovascular disease mortality in the US uh, globally? There are many reasons, but one potential reason is due to the low implementation of what are evidence-based therapies. We know things work to diagnose, treat, and prevent cardiovascular disease once it's occurred, but um, the implementation is low. And some of the co-authors uh, wrote, um, were interviewed ab about this article, um, and uh, Dr. Um, George Mensa, who runs the NIH Center for Translational Research and Implementation Science, who's one of the co who is one of the co-authors of the paper, Said, uh, said that cardiovascular disease is on the rise, but we know how to curb it, we've done it before. And he really points to um, that there are many clinical and public health research findings over the last many years that have led to improvements, but that have not been consistently and effectively translated into routine clinical practice and public health. And 
uh, he mentions that we need a renewed focus on affordable, widely available, and proven effective implementation strategies that help prevent, treat, and control cardiovascular disease and related risk factors. With that in mind, um, and after completing my master's in health, I learned you know, how to uh, examine big, big data. I was interested to see what the prevalence of these guideline medical therapies are in Baltimore City. Um, so I worked with Dr. Deidre Cruz and we examined the prevalence of GDMT uh, among Baltimore residents using a, a NIH, a National Institute of Aging cohort called the Healthy Aging in Neighborhoods of Diversity Across the Lifespan uh, cohort. It's a cohort that examines the association between race, socioeconomic status uh, with health in Baltimore City. Uh, it consisted of black and white adults who are aged 30 to 64 years old. And uh, they sampled above and, high, uh, above and below the poverty uh, status, 125% uh, um, of the federal poverty guidelines from 2004. And we looked at participants who had uh, self-reported that they had had a prior heart attack, prior stroke, atrial fibrillation, or heart failure. Um, they had attended visit four where uh, data was collected on self-reported medication use. And these are our results. Um, among patients who had reported that they had had a prior heart attack, only 35% were on aspirin and 63% were on statins. And um, uh, when we looked at, uh, compared to white individuals, black individuals were less likely to report that they were taking aspirin with the odds ratio of 0 0.29. We didn't find any differences by um, above and below poverty status. Um, we also examined uh, people who had uh, reported that they had a prior stroke and only 16% were on aspirin and 44% were on statins with no differences by race or poverty status. Um, among patients with atrial fibrillation, people who reported that they had atrial fibrillation, only 10% were on anticoagulation. Um, and among participants who reported that they had heart failure, only about 50 to 60% reported that they were on heart failure preventive therapies and no differences by race and poverty status. So uh, our results were published uh, in the journal Racial and Ethnic Disparities in tw uh, 2020. And what uh, we summarized what was that in the sample of adults living in Baltimore, the self-reported use of evidence-based secondary prevention guideline therapies was very low. Um, we found racial differences among Black participants with coronary disease who reported that they were less likely to take aspirin compared to their white participants, to white participants. Um, and contrary to expectations, we didn't find any significant differences um, by poverty status. These findings were eye-opening for me uh, in terms of the low utilization of uh, guideline therapies. And there are um, many reasons why this could be, um, including lack of physician prescription, lack of patient awareness of the benefit of the, of the medications, cost, trustworthiness in the health system, and other social determinants of health that impact people's ability to receive and take these medications. Um, to extend this research further, I wanted to look at patients with heart failure. And the reason I chose heart failure is because, uh, as I showed you earlier, there are several medications that, when used in combination, can reduce the risk of recurrent events and mortality among patients who have a diagnosis of heart failure. So uh, working with um, uh, the ARIC uh, study, the ARIC community surveillance uh, study, it was a study uh, of community surveillance of all events that uh, resulted in hospitalization in four regions in the US, suburban Minneapolis, Minnesota, Washington County, Maryland, Forsyth County, North Carolina, and Jackson, Mississippi. Mississippi. And uh, there was continued surveillance of all people who were hospitalized with heart failure between uh, 2005 and 2014. 
And uh, we examined people who had heart failure by ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes and classified them as either having, uh, and only included them if they had a definite or a probable heart failure admission. And then we were able to, uh, through chart abstraction, look at the medications that they were discharged on on hospital uh, after, on, on the time they were leaving the hospital. And we uh, considered patients being discharged on optimal medical therapy as being discharged on uh, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and mineral relocorticoid receptor antagonists. So in 2005, these three, these three um, pillars were the mainstay for heart failure treatment and were recommended for patients admitted uh, being discharged home uh, with heart failure. So optimal medical therapy was in having all three. Acceptable medical therapy was having uh, two of them and inadequate medical therapy was having none. And then we examined the proportions on GDMT, whether there were racial differences and the trends over time. And what we found was that um, the proportion among both black and white participants uh, or, or patients who were uh, in the ARIC surveillance study was that optimal medical therapy was very low. So proportions being discharged on all three medications was about 10%. Well, about 50 to 60% were discharged on acceptable therapy. So having at least two and uh, between 30 and 40% on no therapies at all. Um, but what we found was that uh, black participants were more likely to be discharged on uh, appropriate uh, medical therapy compared to the white participants. And then we, we looked at the individual therapies. So ACE inhibitors were more likely to be prescribed to black participants. Beta blockers um, had a high implementation, but uh, no differences by race. And hydralazine and nitrates, which is another uh, therapy for heart failure that is less efficacious, was prescribed more to African-Americans. And uh, mineral reliquorocord receptor antagonists were also more prescribed to African-Americans. Uh, and when we examined the trends over time between 2005 and 2014, what we found was that optimal medical therapy, so having three medications that discharge, which is the green uh, bars here among black participants and white participants, remained very low and actually decreased over time. While having uh, uh, adequate therapy, so having two stayed stable, um, and having inadequate therapy pretty much stayed stable. So there were no significant differences in the trend, but this uh, figure just shows the low implementation of appropriate medical therapies for heart failure from as far back as 2005 till our data uh, ended in 2014. So in summary, what we found was that about 8% and 11% of white and black participants respectively hospitalized with heart failure were prescribed optimal therapies and about 40 to 60% were prescribed um, acceptable therapies. And black individuals are more likely to be prescribed um, all three therapies. Uh, and over a 10, 10 year period, there was a trend towards a decline in the prescription of evidence-based therapies, um, especially ACE inhibitors and ARBs and whites. Um, and our research here was published uh, at the, uh, in the Journal of Racial Evidence Disparities in 2021. And my, our co-authors, Dr. Koresh, Dr. Dumele, uh, Dr. Matsushita, uh, and Dr. Cruz, uh, all part of the Wealth Center and uh, Center for Health Equity. Um, Using the ARIC cohort, I, in addition to examining racial differences, I wanted to examine whether the socioeconomic differences predicted who was sent home on uh, guideline therapies. Using the ARIC cohort again, uh, this time we had about 700 participants, 34% were black and 46% were women. And our uh, uh, examination of optimal medical therapy uh, was very similar to the previous study. But this time we examined SES um, measured by income, educational attainment, and area deprivation index. 
And these are the results of uh, the first part of our analysis. We just examined the association of SES with uh, mortality and readmission. And what we found was that among individuals with low income, they were more likely to be readmitted to the hospital and more likely to die, um, have uh, higher, higher risk of mortality compared to individuals with income greater than 50,000. Uh, similarly, for education, we found that individuals who reported that they had less than high school educational attainment had a higher risk of uh, readmission to the hospital and mortality. And uh, when we examined neighborhood deprivation by the area deprivation index, individuals in quartile four who are the most deprived were more likely to be readmitted to the hospital. And there was a trend, but no significant association with mortality. So then we tried to examine whether they, uh, these differences in mortality by SES were um, influenced in any way by differences in guideline medical therapies. And uh, we examined differences in uh, optimal medical therapy. Uh, sorry about the small font, but this is optimal medical therapy by income educational attainment and neighborhood deprivation. And we didn't find any differences by SES, but overall what we saw was that uh, individuals were, um, there was a prescription of optimal medical therapy was less than 10% among people going home with heart failure. People with um, uh, at discharge on adequate medical therapy were about 50 to 60%. Um, so in summary, um, socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, income, education attainment, and neighbor neighborhood deprivation were closely linked to a higher risk of recurrent events. And we found that the prescription of guideline recommended therapies for heart failure was very low, but we didn't find any significant differences by SES. And it was unclear why we saw these this, this discrepancy, but potentially other social determinants of health are likely a driver of these findings. So now I'm just gonna pivot to uh, my current research um, and first talk to you about cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, in 2019, um, I was um, appointed to be the director of cardiac rehabilitation at Hopkins. And at the time, I didn't know much about cardiac rehabilitation, even being a cardiologist. Um, and, um, and I learned a lot more about cardiac rehab and hopefully I can impart to you uh, how amazing cardiac rehab is uh, in the rest of this talk. And to illustrate uh, what cardiac rehab is, I'll just uh, give you a patient case. It's actually an actual patient of mine who in May, 2020, uh, at the height of the pandemic, a uh, 61-year-old woman, she's a retired nurse, had just been hospitalized with COVID-19. And um, during the hospitalization, she was sent to recover at the Baltimore Convention Center um, because she couldn't go home. She had a mother, her mother at home and she didn't wanna uh, recover at home and potentially infect her mother. Um, so she recovered, but once she went home, she still had significant shortness of breath while walking. And during that hospitalization, she was told, but I couldn't recall that she something was wrong with one of her heart valves. And given her symptoms, she really was unable to do any activities of daily living. Her other medical problems were hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. And um, we did an echocardiogram and what we found was that she had severe aortic stenosis. This is a blockage in one of her heart valves. It wasn't opening well and was likely contributing to her symptoms. And that same year, she ended up getting a valve replacement. But I saw her in the hospital after the valve replacement and she was quite uh, weak and deconditioned because of the heart surgery and laying in bed for several days. Uh, she was scared to resume her uh, activities of daily living and she had previously been sedentary. So she was really, um, uh, really scared of exercising and um, uh, getting back to her regular activities. Um, so we talked about cardiac rehabilitation and I referred her to cardiac rehabilitation and I'll come to her next um, at the end of the talk. So what is cardiac rehabilitation? 
It's an amazing program. It's a comprehensive outpatient secondary prevention strategy and includes all these things. It includes exercise, uh, patients are prescribed an exercise, given up exercise prescription, they exercise on site, and then when they're not on site, they exercise at home. When they're on site, they have EKG monitoring to uh, look for any uh, problems with arrhythmias. But there are other things that happen at cardiac rehab. Their uh, smoking cessation counseling occurs, pharmacologic therapy, so patients are uh, talk, uh, are um, discuss their medical therapies, any problems with uh, taking their medications, uh, any problems with getting their prescriptions. Uh, there's depression and anxiety counseling, so we uh, uh, screen for depression, and if there's uh, depression or anxiety, they're referred to um, the appropriate um, counselors. There's one-on-one -on -one education uh, and also group sessions. And there's also, there's also dietary counseling. Uh, nutritionist uh, comes frequently to our cardiac rehab once a week to counsel patients on um, their diet. So it's really a comprehensive program for secondary prevention. And these are just some pictures of what cardiac rehab looks like. This is a typical picture with an exercise physiologist here, monitoring with EKG. And these are patients exercising and all of them uh, have EKG monitors on them that feed right into the um, physiologist desk here uh, to uh, look for any arrhythmias. And these are all just pictures of cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, we have two cardiac rehab centers at Hopkins. Um, the first one, uh, the main one is at Bayview Hospital uh, here in the uh, eastern part of uh, Baltimore City. Um, and then the second site is at Green Spring, which is further north, but this um, location is currently closed. And this is just an, a picture of uh, what the cardiac, cardiac rehab center looks like. And who's eligible for cardiac rehab? In fact, everyone is actually eligible for cardiac rehab. It's just that um, insurance only pays for certain indications. Uh, and rec um, these indications are recommended as a class 1A indication by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. So if you've had a heart attack, if you have angina pectoris, which is chest pain due to narrow uh, cardiac arteries, if you have had a heart surgery, the bypass surgery or valve replacement, if, you ha if you've had a stent, heart or lung transplant, if, you've had, if you have uh, symptomatic peripheral vascular disease, meaning narrowed uh, arteries of the leg arteries um, and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. You are eligible for cardiac rehab and most insurances, Medicare and Medicaid will pay for uh, up to 36 sessions um, over 36 weeks of cardiac rehab. There are several phases of cardiac rehab. Um, this is just a schematic of uh, primary prevention, which is reducing risk factors for events. But once patients have events, um, there's phase one cardiac rehab, which occurs in the hospital. And it's really the patient getting back to uh, functional mobility, learning how to walk again, how to uh, climb stairs, and they work with physical therapy in the hospital to do this. And in the hospital, usually a physician uh, refers the patient to cardiac rehab and discusses the benefits uh, of cardiac rehab and encourages the patient to go to cardiac rehab. And then phase two is a program that we mainly deal with. Um, this is structured and closely monitored exercise program that's covered by insurance and a physician uh, presence is required for cardiac rehab uh, in phase two. Once patients finish uh, phase two cardiac rehab, then they can go on to maintenance cardiac rehab. It's less structured. Patients don't have to wear EKG monitor. No physician is required, but insurance doesn't cover this. Uh, it's usually self pay, but uh, it's a very low cost. At least in our institution, it's about $30 a month to come and exercise at the rehab center. What are the outcomes after attending cardiac rehab? Uh, these are, this is from a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials showing that cardiac rehab is associated with a 47% reduction in uh, a second heart attack after the first one, 36% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, a 26% reduction in all-cause all mortality, 
and a 30%, up to a 30% reduction in a readmission in that first year after the event. Um, it not only improves outcomes like these, but improves quality of life, increases the ability to return to work, and improves risk factor profile, smoking cessation, weight, lipids, and blood pressure. However, uh, despite the benefits of cardiac rehab, uh, there's overwhelming evidence um, that, even though there's overwhelming evidence of its effectiveness, it's markedly underutilized. There are several studies that have shown that nationwide, only 20 to 30% of eligible patients uh, who are eligible for cardiac rehab actually participate in cardiac rehab. And what we know is that there are significant disparities by race, gender, age, and socioeconomic status. These are two reviews. One uh, I did with Dr. La Princess Brewer uh, at Mayo, and one I did with uh, a colleague here at Hopkins, where we describe uh, the significant uh, disparities that have been documented in utilization of cardiac rehab by race, by socioeconomic status, and gender. And this is one of the graphics that we uh, showed in that article. Uh, just you turn your attention to the middle panel. It shows that over 2.1 million patients are eligible for cardiac rehab every year. So these are people who have a heart attack, who've had a stent or have bypass surgery or valve surgery. But there's significant disparities in who's referred to cardiac rehab because cardiac rehab needs, uh, requires a referral from a physician. So among them, um, only 20 to 30% end up enrolling in cardiac rehab. And even a less amount, only 10% end up finishing all 36 sessions of cardiac rehabilitation. So this triangle just shows a sig significant um, gap um, that needs to be filled in terms of improving the implementation of cardiac rehab. And uh, on the left here, just showing the evidence of uh, disparities by race, by gender, socioeconomic status, and also geography. Urban areas and rural areas are, urban areas, for example, uh, cities that are very high density have um, scarcity of uh, 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 cardiac rehab facilities that are accessible, similarly in rural areas. I showed you a schematic of uh, Baltimore City and the main cardiac rehabilitation was all the way at Baby, which is very hard to reach for many patients um, who are admitted in the East Baltimore campus. So um, with that in mind, uh, we looked at uh, the data for Johns Hopkins between 2018 and 2019. We looked at all the patients who were admitted in that two year period with an indication for cardiac rehab. And um, so what we found was that about 3,700 uh, had come in with a heart attack uh, in those two years, 2,300 with heart failure, about 200 had bypass surgery, about 500 had stents, and about 2,300 had valve replacement and only 12 heart transplants. And these were only individuals who lived in the catchment area of the Hopkins Cardiac Rehab, so Baltimore City. And then we examined the referral and enrollment. And in yellow, what we see is that referral for cardiac rehab was very low. So among patients with MI, only about 20% are actually referred by their physician at the time of discharge or within the few months after discharge. And even less, about 5% end up enrolling. We see similar disparities in heart failure, bypass surgery, stents, and valve replacements. And uh, potential reasons for this low utilization of cardiac rehabilitation is the main one is lack of referrals by physicians, lack of clinician awareness of the benefits of cardiac rehab, implicit bias uh, about whether patients will participate. There's data showing that um, sometimes phys physicians feel that the patients will not go to cardiac rehab, and so they're less likely to refer. Uh, long wait times to attend cardiac rehab because we only have one facility and uh, this, it takes about a month to get into cardiac rehab and other costs and other barriers. But we also examined the benefits of cardiac rehab at Hopkins. And what we found was that among people who did not go to cardiac rehab, the odds of being readmitted with um, an event within that next year was about three. So 
threefold higher risk of being readmitted with an event. So cardiac rehab works, but there's a huge gap in terms of uh, implementation. Um, in other preliminary work, we also examined the uh, predictors of cardiac rehab participation in the ARIC study uh, uh, between 1991 and 2015. And we were able to know who attended cardiac rehab because of uh, people who uh, had Medicare and linkage to the CMS claims. And we examined people who had an indication of cardiac rehab shown here. So bypass, uh, stents, or valve replacements or heart attack. And we examined social socioeconomic characteristics and social support and social isolation. And this study population was about 1,200 people who were eligible for cardiac rehab. 16% were Black, 43% were women, and 26%. Only 26% were actually ended up participating in cardiac rehab. And when we examined uh, income, we found that compared to individuals with the highest income, individuals with lower income were less likely to participate in cardiac rehab. For education, similarly, ind individuals with lower uh, educational attainment were less likely to participate. And individuals with uh, uh, higher area deprivation or deprived neighborhoods were also less likely to participate. And when we examined um, social support by the interpersonal support evaluation list, individuals with the lowest uh, reported social support uh, were less likely to participate in cardiac rehab compared to the highest, and individuals uh, who reported uh, social isolation by the Lubin Social Network Scale, there was a trend towards lower participation, uh, but there was lower participation in uh, Model 1, which was uh, just adjusted for demographics. Um, so in summary from this uh, study uh, that's still preliminary is that uh, in the community, in the Arab community, and in uh, overall, similar to the US uh, findings, 26% of eligible individuals actually enroll in cardiac rehab. And we found significant disparities uh, in enrollment by SES. So uh, next, I just wanted to uh, move on to what are the drivers of low cardiac rehab utilization among racial and ethnic minorities? and individuals who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. As I said, um, cardiac rehab requires a referral and then enrollment and then completion. And um, just to summarize, uh, disparities in cardiac rehab procedures are one of the drivers. So for example, two patients who come in with a heart attack, there's data that shows individuals who are lower socioeconomic status and minorities are less likely to be referred for stents and bypass surgery. And in that, in, in that same vein, they're less likely to be referred to cardiac rehab. People with insurance that, who are underinsured uh, with higher co-pays are less likely to be referred. Uh, access to rehab centers, so physicians who don't have rehab centers affiliated with our hospitals are less likely to refer. And other healthcare provider factors, so knowledge about cardiac rehab and implicit bias. And then uh, what drives low enrollment rates? There's healthcare provider factors. So um, one of the biggest drivers of why, why patients enroll in cardiac rehab is endorsement and encouragement by their physician. So their physician says, enroll in cardiac rehab, it's amazing. It's gonna get you back to where you were. Patients are more likely to enroll. Uh, other SES related factors such as co-pays, logistics, transportation and com com uh, competing commitments and interpersonal factors. So trustworthiness in the health system and the cardiac rehab staff and pain perceived need. Um, so with this in mind, um, as a cardiologist trained in how to diagnose and treat cardiovascular disease, and as an epidemiologist, I learned how to analyze big data sets and understand risk factors for disease, understand utilization, However, I felt that I needed to take the next step to actually address these disparities. So I first approached Dr. Cooper and Dr. Cruz in about 2018 and asked if I could be involved in work at the Center for Health Equity because of the amazing work that the center does um, <clears throat> to, um, to using theory and research to target factors that contribute to health disparities on multiple levels, the individual, 
family, organization, community, and health policy level. And the use of implementation science and theories to integrate their findings and evidence based into healthcare and policy. And the use of community based participatory research, really a collaborative approach that includes key stakeholders such as the individuals being studied, the researchers and, the, and other representatives in all aspects of the research program design. Um, and my involvement in the Center for Health Equity Community Advisory Board and uh, Center for Health Equity Projects, the Rich Life Project and the MATCH Project. Um, and also yesterday I noticed, um, I, I noted that uh, there's a new article that came out from the AHA, a scientific statement on leveraging implementation science to address cardiovascular health. With this in mind, I wanted to um, try to address uh, disparities in cardiac rehabilitation using uh, mentorship from the Center for Health Equity and um, the skills of implementation science and community-based participatory research. Um, in the <clears throat> article that uh, the review I had done with Dr. Brewer, we had talked about different ways that we can uh, increase cardiac rehabilitation participation focused on health equity. And I'll go through each of them individually. The first one is um, promoting evidence-based guidelines. Um, and this really uh, goes towards referral strategies. So one way we can do it is automatic referrals to cardiac rehab through the electronic records. So when a patient is admitted to the hospital, if they have a diagnosis that requires cardiac rehab, when they go home, that they go home with a referral to cardiac rehab. And research has shown that increases um, referrals increase uh, participation threefold, including uh, individuals with uh, low socioeconomic status. And this has an effect on systematizing referral reduced biases associated with, associated with the referrals. Another strategy is using peer navigators or community health workers to address barriers and assist with the health navigation after hospital discharge. And this uh, was actually studied by Grace et al. and Ben Scott et al., uh, where an inpatient liaison increased cardiac rehab participation fourfold and a peer navigator increased threefold. So a peer navigator was a pa uh, patient who had previously had cardiovascular disease who came to the hospital and um, encouraged patients who were eligible to uh, get a referral from their doctor and attend cardiac rehab. Other things we're doing is education of clinician, clinicians using in-services and presentations. Other strategies are novel cardiac rehab delivery methods. Um, cardiac rehab centers are scarce um, and patients uh, have difficulty accessing them due to transportation barriers, time constraints, for example, if they're working or they're, they're the primary caregiver. Um, and these, uh, the scarcity was actually exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which resulted in closures of multiple cardiac rehab centers throughout the country. Um, and so to that note, we are partnering with um, the Cardiac Rehab Center, partnered with um, the Center for um, the MTech Rehab Team, which includes um, the Digital Health Lab uh, led by Dr. Seth Martin and Dr. Francois Marvel uh, and Dr. Yvonne Commodore Mensa um, and the Center for Health Equity, uh, Nancy Malello and many other um, colleagues here where uh, we're planning to implement a virtual cardiac rehab using an application, a mobile application called Cori. And a bit about what Cori is, it's a mobile app that does a variety of things shown here. Um, and it does, um, uh, patients are able to do medication adherence, they're able to access exercise modules, exercise on a timer and describe the symptoms that they're having and have close ties to their clinicians. So if they have symptoms, they can easily contact their clinicians. And there's also education associated with the app. To develop the app, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Martin, Dr. Marvel, Dr. Komodo Mensa, and Dr. And, and Nancy Bello, uh, used uh, principles of human-centered design to develop the app 
with the input of patients, families, and clinicians. And then uh, part of the digital health lab is this concept of health tech weedy, meaning that uh, for patients who don't have um, a Fitbit or Apple Watch to be able to track their uh, um, their movement or their exercise or iPhone. There's provision uh, of loaner uh, Fitbits, Apple Watches, and um, a smartphone. And so we're uh, in the process of planning for a clinical trial that will uh, randomize about 150, um, 300 patients to usual care, so center-based cardiac rehabilitation compared to hybrid virtual cardiac rehabilitation. Uh, hybrid rehabilitation meaning that they can come to the center, but then they um, are able to exercise at home in the convenience of their home at their own time using the Cori app. And the outcomes are six minute walk tests, so fitness and key outcomes like LDL, um, psychosocial metrics and cost of care. We are also uh, partnering with uh, Dr. Le Princess Brewer, who's uh, developed a virtual world-based cardiac rehabilitation program. So patients who are not actually able to come to the center can do this through virtual reality, a virtual world technology, as an alternative way to access cardiac rehabilitation education. So this is an example of patient ed patients attending an education session um, exercising on a treadmill in a virtual world cardiac rehab center, peer support groups, and uh, participating in yoga. So this is um, uh, one of the potential studies that we will, we are going to be partnering with Dr. Brewer on. Um, other strategies that we highlighted to uh, improve cardiac rehabilitation participation included increasing the diver diversity in cardiac re rehab uh, professionals and also health equity metrics. And I'll just briefly go through this um, because I'm running out of time, but there was a survey done in 2010 uh, of all cardiac rehab uh, uh, members uh, who are members of the AACVPR. And among 1,000 respondents, only 1% 1 were African-American. So there's an urgent and ongoing need for diversity, inclusion, and equity in, in the cardiology workforce and also cultural competence in healthcare. Um, what um, diversity in the, in the cardiology workforce and in healthcare workforce has been shown to do is have better patient provider relationships, increased satisfaction, higher quality of care and trustworthiness in the health system. And then briefly, I'll just mention health equity metrics, meaning uh, measuring the impact of hospitals and health systems uh, based on how the health of the community surrounding them uh, does. So. Uh, uh, including health equity metrics in the world uh, national rankings. So the US News and World uh, Report that ranks hospitals annually potentially to include health equity metrics and including high quality cardiac rehabilitation as part of a health equity metric. And lastly, I'll just briefly talk about my research in progress. And this actually goes through uh, these three different potential, these three different um, uh, ways that we can improve cardiac rehabilitation use using community partnerships, inclusion in clinical research, and reducing barriers. And this research in progress is a K23 grant entitled Addressing Low Cardiac Rehabilitation Participation Among Patients with Low Socioeconomic Status. And really the background is uh, what I've mentioned to you already, that uh, there's a rising uh, cardiovascular mortality and disparities Cardiac rehab is amazing, but it's underutilized. And many of the previous interventions have not focused on minorities and individuals with low SES. And so the goal for this project was to adapt an existing and effective navigator intervention that I had mentioned briefly before to address the unique barriers among patients with low SES. So the previous intervention by ben, Dr. Ben Scott, who's one of the mentors on my K23, uh, she developed this peer navigator intervention that included education and social support. It was two women, they were both African-American, who'd come to the hospital, talk about cardiac rehab, its benefits, and uh, encourage patients to go to cardiac rehab. And this it resulted in a threefold higher um, participation rate. 
Um, and the goal of this project uh, is to actually adapt it uh, to be able to address barriers among patients with low SES and minorities. And it'll be adapted by a needs assessment and identif identification of barriers. We'll provide sustained social support, health system navigation, and tailored education. And this, um, this uh, uh, intervention will be called the heart-to-heart -heart intervention. So briefly, um, aim one will be to identify factors associated with cardiac rehab referral and enrollment, and basically identifying structural and health system factors. So things about the provider, their specialty, and things about the individual, social economic status, race, ethnicity, and age associated with cardiac rehab to identify individuals at highest risk of not participating in cardiac rehab. These are individuals who have been traditionally excluded from cardiac rehab due to lack of referral or bar barriers to participation. And we'll use um, Johns Hopkins uh, study population, patients admitted to Johns Hopkins with a cardiovascular event um, eligible for cardiac rehab. And this is just an image of uh, how we'll uh, um, assess SCS using the area deprivation index. And this is just a picture of Baltimore City and Baltimore County and um, uh, deciles of area deprivation between uh, one and 10, the most deprived neighborhoods, meaning the highest deprived neighbor neighborhoods are in red and the least deprived neighborhoods are in blue. And so we'll examine the um, referral and enrollment in cardiac rehab based on uh, people's neighborhood, in addition to demographic and other clinical characteristics. We do have some preliminary data that I wanted to show you here. So we did examine over the two years who was actually referred to cardiac rehab and who enrolled in cardiac rehab. And what we found is uh, very striking results. There were about 4,000 patients in, who, who were eligible for cardiac rehab, but only about 26% were referred to cardiac rehab. And when we examined by race, what we found was that African-Americans uh, were less likely to be referred to cardiac rehab compared to white participants with uh, a trend towards lower referral, but not, no significance among other minorities. Um, individuals who were from lower income zip codes were less likely to be referred. Individuals who were on Medicare and Medicaid were less likely to be referred compared to people on commercial insurance. And then also individuals who are admitted to non-cardiology services were less likely to be referred. And then in terms of enrollment, we found that uh, African-Americans, even when referred, were less likely to enroll. Uh, individuals with lower income were less likely to enroll. And um, individuals who were admitted to general medicine and other clinical services, not cardiovascular services, were less likely to enroll. So these are some preliminary uh, data from this work. And so in summary, only 19% of eligible patients are referred to cardiac rehab within our system. About 5% of eligible patients actually enroll and um, significant disparities by race, uh, gender, and uh, socioeconomic status and people on uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and so aim two of the, the project will be, now that we know that there's significant disparities, I wanted to determine the perceived barriers to cardiac rehab enrollment in patients with low socioeconomic status. And my goal is to do um, in-depth semi-structured interviews among 40 patients, half who are referred and half who are not, who are referred and did not participate, really to understand um, uh, barriers, facilitators, uh, um, barriers and facilitators uh, to attend cardiac rehab. I'll use a behavioral framework called the COMB, Capability, Motivation and Opportunity um, uh, framework uh, to understand uh, systematically what patients face and the barriers that they face to attending cardiac rehab. And this is just a schematic of potential reasons that patients say they attend cardiac rehab or don't attend cardiac rehab. So uh, in terms of capability, patients may say that they have uh, physical issues getting to the cardiac rehab, so transportation or physical function, their awareness of cardiac rehab or knowledge of cardiac rehab, uh, 
Uh, we'll assess their motivation. So the perceived need, some patients say they, they don't need cardiac rehab, they, they walk already. And also their trustworthiness of the, health, of the health team. Maybe they don't trust the health team and that's why they don't pursue cardiac rehab. And then opportunity. So do they have the appropriate transportation? Do they have accessibility? Um, and competing priorities. So do they work and they need um, time outside of work or late, later hours, uh, cardiac rehab open to later hours for them to participate. And the knowledge from this aim will be used to enhance the heart-to-heart -heart intervention. And my aim three is I will refine the heart-to-heart -heart intervention and test its feasibility and acceptability among patients with low SES referred to cardiac rehab. And I'll use uh, uh, the community-based participatory research principles and convene an advisory board consisting of key stakeholders, patients, cardiac rehab staff, cardiologists, the peer navigators and administrators, and continue to refine the intervention based on ongoing feedback. And lastly, uh, the goal is to do a feasibility assessment in 50 patients using the heart-to-heart -heart intervention delivered by a patient navigator and addressing four key components. First, they'll have a needs assessment, education and reinforcement about the importance of cardiac rehab, health system navigation, so providing direct assistance in enrolling into cardiac rehab, liaising with clinical staff, assisting with appointments, and social support. So sustained um, engagement, activation, and empowering both patients and families uh, and to encourage them to uh, go to cardiac rehab. The primary outcomes will be feasibility, acceptability, and fidelity. And the secondary outcomes will be impact on cardiac rehab participation. Um, I just wanted to close by saying um, the Million Hearts Cardiac Rehab Collaborative was a collaborative by the CDC, Health and Human Services, ACC, AHA, and ACVPR, where they wanted in 2017 a roadmap to increase cardiac rehab from 20 to 70 percent. Currently, at the time, it was 20 percent, and they felt that increasing cardiac rehab from 20 to 70 percent could save 25,000 lives and prevent 180,000 hospitalizations annually in the US. Unfortunately, it's still 2022. This paper was written in 2017. Cardiac rehab participation is still 20, 20%, 20 to 30%. So we need new strategies to increase cardiac rehab, especially among patients who are least likely or underserved by cardiac rehab. So back to the patient case I had mentioned in the beginning, so my patient enrolled in cardiac rehab in 2021. She completed 36 sessions over 12 weeks of phase two cardiac rehab. And up to now I see her, she continues to go to cardiac rehab about one to two times a week. And what she says, it's been life-changing. It improved her fitness, her quality of life, blood pressure and diabetes are under control. And she's pretty much back to her baseline. So uh, I just wanted to conclude um, by saying uh, today I outlined the epidemiology of cardiovascular mortality, the wealth of strategies that we know work, but the underutilization of these secondary prevention strategies, and then strategies to increase cardiac rehab participation that centers on cell health equity. Uh, just to close, I want to thank a few people, uh, the Center for Health Equity, Dr. Cooper, Dr. Cruz, and Dr. Ndumale, uh, my team at uh, Dr. Kuni Matsushita's lab, um, Cardiovascular Epi uh, mentors, Dr. Koresh and Dr. Selvin, uh, Cardiac Rehab mentors and team, uh, Dr. Stewart, the Digital Health Lab, um, my other K23 mentors, and my colleagues, Dr. Ibe and Dr. Venkataranami, who've uh, been with me through this application and have really uh, inspired me uh, to take the next steps to address disparities using implementation science. And with that, I'll uh, take questions. I had to unmute to applaud. <laughs> so, Lena, that, that was just um, spectacular. Um, just a really, um, just a tremendous um, amount of work that you, that you put in. I feel like I, I got to have a front row seat in a little bit of it, but certainly did not um, did not know and enjoyed seeing the full breadth of all the all the um, great work that you've been putting in, such necessary work. I think you, you'll 
when you get a chance, you'll see in the chat, it was buzzing. Um, uh, people uh, shocked uh, by um, some of the, the sort of findings that you shared about um, the underutilization of this of such important therapy. And, and wow, did you wave the flag for cardiac rehab? I, I, I don't yet need secondary prevention, but I was excited to, <laughs> to know that it exists and sounds so wonderful. Um, so, so really thank you so much. I want to open it up and, and see if folks have questions. You can, um, either raise your hand or, um, shout it out if you, uh, right, you there's one question hand in real hand. Yeah. There's a question in the chat, I think from Martha oh. Saylor. Yes. So Ma yeah, Martha Afshar Saylor. Yeah. So Martha, did you want to, um, speak your question or I can summarize it for you? Sure. Lena, thank you so much for this work. I'm so excited about your attention to heart failure and cardiac rehab. And I'm just curious about your interest in social support. We've been working with heart failure caregivers for a long time. And um, I love your focus on social support in a couple of your studies. I just wondered how you how you think about engaging, if you ever see families coming to cardiac rehab or um, caregivers accompanying, it's, it's so affordable. It seems like a great opportunity to increase activity in a family. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I think the time point to uh, get both patients and families involved is uh, uh, while they're in the hospital. A lot of times when a patient is being sent home, you have the family around them, the primary caregiver there. And this is like the perfect time point for physicians, clinicians to talk about cardiac rehab, not only to the patient, but to the family. Um, because, uh, you know, especially when patients go home after a heart attack, bypass, they're really uh, relying on the support of their family to bring them to the hospital, to bring them to appointments. And so uh, leveraging social support uh, is key. And what you can see is that um, social support is really a key driver for why people don't come to cardiac rehab. Uh, and so the, the intervention that we were proposing ha, uh, includes uh, leveraging a, a peer or a patient navigator to be able to provide some of the social support, but really family is key to getting people to cardiac rehab and to other uh, secondary prevention therapies. Great. Other questions? Oh, I see. Okay, uh, Dr. Lucy. <laughs> Wonderful work, Lena, Dr. Matthews, that was fantastic. Um, as one of your uh, supporters and champions, I have a question regarding policy. So as a health system, when we decide where to put cardiac rehab um, and how to make it accessible, I realize that it's not always most accessible to those in the inner city. So from like a systems perspective, a structural perspective, how can we um, reshape how we place these services for our patients? That's a great question. Uh, and you allude to an important point that um, Hopkins has two cardiac rehabilitation centers, but one of them is actually closed currently. Mm -hmm. And the reason cardiac rehabilitation uh, centers are so scarce, particularly in underserved communities, inner city communities is the low reimbursement. So someone can come in and get a procedure like a heart echocardiogram or a stent, and you get reimbursed a lot more than someone who comes in and does cardiac rehabilitation. So hospitals actually end up uh, losing money on cardiac rehabilitation. So there's this in, uh, tendency to disinvest in programs like cardiac rehabilitation in the short term because they don't make the uh, a reimbursement right away. But what people fail to realize is that it actually improves long-term outcomes. Um, that data I showed you showed a threefold higher readmission rate in the year after a cardiac, um, uh, in people who did not go to cardiac rehabilitation. So we've met um, with you know, the heads of the hospital, uh, um, including Dr. Red Redonda Miller and uh, you know, discussed the importance of cardiac rehab. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we don't have a lot of power in determining where the cardiac rehab centers should be. Ideally, there should be one on the East Baltimore campus and then one at Bayview. Um, and um, hopefully our research and our findings can help drive, uh, the, uh, drive the hospital to invest more in cardiac rehab. But um, hopefully I answered your question. Dr. Cooper. <laughs> 
Yeah, I I have less of a question and I'm just kind of a comment that builds on what we were just talking about, what Dr. Lucy just mentioned. And, you know, I think that when you think about trying to change policy, um, one of the things that I've, I guess, learned in my short <laughs> uh, stint in trying to, to be involved in, in policy translation is that you really have to understand um, what the incentives are that different um leaders and decision makers have for, uh, you know, investing resources. And so the hospital itself, it would seem to me, is, doesn't have a lot of incentive for investing in cardiac rehab because, you know, um, if people get sick and get readmitted, they get more money, right? I mean, I hate to make it sound like that. So it's really the people who who care about it or who really could benefit from cardiac rehab are not only the patients and the family members themselves, which really, you know, um, you really want them to be part of your advocacy efforts, but also the insurers, the people who actually pay for that care because they're the ones who also are going to feel it. Feel it. So I think, um, I don't know to what extent you've been engaged with payers, but it seems like Medicare ought to care about this if they don't because it's really coming directly out of their budget with all with all these people with heart failure uh, being admitted to hospitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point um, to include Medicare and other payers in this. Um, you know, Medicare does uh, cover many of these indications, but we've had barriers with a lot of uh, other insurances that either don't allow their, don't reimburse uh, for cardiac rehab or have low reimbursements and big co-pays. But you're right, bringing um, payers to the table is an important uh, part of increasing cardiac rehab, um, especially among individuals who are underserved by it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. No, no, you, I, you did. You did. And I just think, you know, as since you mentioned um, having using a community engaged approach, I think the sooner you engage those folks as you develop these programs and understand what it is they would want to see uh, in order to, in, to shape their decision making, um, hope the idea is that hopefully they would uh, be willing to support such programs um, if they're shown to be effective. Mm -hmm. And that's a great point to include uh, payers in this discussion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Maryland is unique. Uh, we have this thing called global bundle payment uh, where hospitals are penalized for readmission within the first 30 days. So it's also in the interest of Hopkins or mm -hmm. hospitals in Maryland yeah. to reduce readmissions. That's well. true. That's true. Those quality metrics do matter to them. So if you can sort of really make that point yeah. With them. <laughs> I will I will try to hopefully have a meeting with them. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Dr. McGill. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so I am a rehab psychologist and postdoctoral fellow. And I may have missed this, but I would love to hear more about the role and the nature of you all's collaboration with psychologists or mental health providers in the in the program. Um, as we've been mentioning before, you know, cardiac rehab programs are really under under resourced. So, in an ideal setting, you would have exercise physiologists, a nurse, a nutritionist, and a psychologist on staff. Uh, but currently, what we have is that uh, patients are screened for depression and anxiety, and if they meet criteria for requiring treatment, then we do refer them to social work and to the appropriate. Um, uh, psychotherapy uh, services. So we don't have anyone on staff at the moment, but um, based on you know how severe their disease is, uh, we do end up referring them to get care. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it sounds like we folks are raising kind of similar concerns. Dr. Um, Abshire Saylor was re uh, sort of um, highlighting kind of the social support um, piece, I think would be of such concern as well as the um, broader, you know, behavioral health considerations here. And I see we have a question from Dr. Ebay as well. Hi, um, I, well, for one, that this was such an amazing talk. Thank you so much, Lena. I'm so impressed and inspired by your work. And the question that I have is actually like a big, big picture question. So if you were to 
look ahead to the next five to 10 years, what would you like your work to have accomplished in terms of the impact that it makes, um, the stakeholders you've engaged and that sort of thing? Um, that's a tough question, but hopefully I'll be able to answer. I think um, as someone who does, you know, clinic and inpatient work and admits patients who've had cardiovascular events, I think in the end, what I would wanna see uh, from my work and the work from the Center for Health Equity is that we actually reduce the uh, preventable events. So people coming in with uh, a heart attack because they were not able to afford or take a statin or take aspirin or people who come back in because they were not able to cardiac go to cardiac rehab or people who die from heart failure because they were not put on the appropriate medical therapies or referred for the right defibrillator. So I think in the end, you know, cardiac rehab is one of the many things I'm interested in, but I think overall I'm interested in implementation of what we already know um, and have it work for people who are most underserved. So uh, people who are uh, minorities, uh, people who are low socioeconomic status, um, women, um, immigrants, people without insurance. So ha have things that we know already work um, being accessible to people who need them. That's terrific. So um, thank you again, really for such a tremendous uh, talk. And, and you can tell from the questions and the comments in the chat that people are really excited about your work and, and, um, and, and grateful that you're doing it. So, so one, uh, we're, we're at the end of the, of our 90 minutes together. I think we could keep going as <laughs> uh, people are so engaged, but um, thank you again, Dr. Matthews, and thank all of you for tuning in. We will thank see you, you next. Thank you all for the wonderful comments. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Really this wonderful. was wonderful. And we'll see you all next, uh, next month. See you next month. Thank you.